my squadron, when I was on operations, I lost about eight of my pals through being shot down by enemy action. That was a tough time. My backpack becomes lighter when I discuss what I've done in Afghanistan. The students that I have been connecting with have been incredibly knowledgeable, inspired, and respectful of the idea of remembrance. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Libby Snymer. Welcome to the Zoomer, I'm Libby Snymer. That was Marcus Venables from the Salvation Army playing the last post bugle call. November the 11th is Remembrance Day, the day we honor all of our veterans and service personnel past and present. This year marks the 103rd anniversary of the armistice agreement that ended the First World War. Today we look back on the sacrifices made by so many and ask whether we are doing enough to remember. We'll also discuss the role of our military today and whether Canada is living up to its responsibilities to veterans. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. At the base of this tower, there is a small room In the center of this room, there are eight books. They're called the Books of Remembrance. Herein is written the name of every Canadian who died while in uniform. There are more than 120,000 names. At 11 o'clock each day, a page is turned. Over the course of a year, every name is displayed at least once. It's called the turning of the pages. A solemn ceremony honoring those who served. And ensuring their memory is never lost. Well, we have gathered a very impressive group of military people, retired and current, and I want to start by asking what their service was and is. Lieutenant General Richard Romer, your service continues. What did you do in wartime? In wartime, I was a fighter reconnaissance uh, pilot, flying Mustang fighters. I did D-Day, the Battle of Normandy, and all the other battles that were involved. I did 135 low-level reconnaissance missions. I caught Field Marshal Rommel, started the uh, operation that took him out. And that was the kind of work that I did with a camera, with my eyes. Never fired the guns in my Mustang fighter in uh, anger, but uh, I got shot at every time I did my one of my 135 missions. So that was what I did when I was 19 and 20. Wow. Major Jim Parks, what about you? Well, I was in the infantry, the uh, Winnipeg Rifles, and uh, 
we did a lot of training in, 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 uh, in England prior to D-Day, including assault landing training, training for about three or four months. Then we got prepared for, uh, for D-Day itself. And we left overnight on the, the 5th of June, and I was in the mortar platoon, and we were in a big landing craft tank. Our boat hit a mine, and we completely sank in the water. The water was about six feet deep. I just threw my equipment off and headed in for shore. And uh, finally got into shore, and the, uh, the uh, infantry companies had just landed seconds before. I popped beside this Corporal Scaife. I knew his name. And uh, since I lost all my equipment, and he was mortally wounded, I took his stand gun and I, I took a small plaque off the back, and I headed into shore and uh, took cover of the, by the sand dunes and waited for our, our platoon commander to come in. That took about uh, a few minutes longer. Wow. Michael Abkata, retired Master Corporal. My service started in 1987. I joined the Army Reserve and was a reservist until I retired in 2016. I served as part of Task Force 107 Roto 3 in Kandahar, Afghanistan, as part of the Canadian Battle Group in Force Protection. My roles and responsibilities were after Op Medusa, the large Canadian push into RC South, as we called it, or Kandahar province. I was in RG 31s, which was a newly purchased up armored vehicle, escorting convoys to the Ford operating bases in uh, the Canadian area of operations. Everything moved by road. Our responsibilities were the Taliban would try to stop the convoys. We would move to the contact side and engage the Taliban and push the convoys through. We also had other responsibilities and other duties called Triple R. Uh, unfortunately, when uh, Canadian armored vehicles hit IEDs, which is improvised explosive devices, it was our responsibility to recover the vehicles, bring them back to CAF. So I did my tour in Afghanistan, like I said, in 2007. 22 young Canadians were killed on my tour. And as a reservist, it's uh, always been a privilege to serve under Queen's Colors. Uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Susan Beharial. I joined right out of high school and was a member of the first platoon of women to do the same basic officers training as the men. Even our own instructors didn't think women can't do that. And I was then the first woman officer um, allowed into the intelligence profession. My first operational posting was to Cold Lake, Alberta. This was in the early 80s, when the bear bombers from the Soviet Union were coming across the pole into the Canadian Arctic and just outside our defense zone. So as part, part of NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, um, Canada had purchased the CF-18s in order to find and intercept in international airspace uh, the Soviet bear bombers. Had the bombers been going for real, they could have just entered Canadian airspace, gone not very far, and launched um, nuclear missiles at the missile bases in the States. Fascinating. And... Retired Lieutenant Commander Bill Shedd. If I've been retired too long, I can't remember some of the things I did. However, the, probably the most memorable was being deployed uh, to our war station in the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was serving in a frigate at the time, and uh, it was pretty exciting. I just returned the ship after leave, and we were told to go out to the ammunition de depot, re-ammunition, and head out to sea to our war station. It was an exciting few days, but uh, kind of anticlimactic because we just bored holes in the ocean looking for submarines that probably were not in our area. Uh, aside from that, there's my service was rather routine uh, because being a peacetime sailor, you you really train for things that you hope never happen. Today we don't have as many. Second World War veterans. We started out with 1.12 million at the end of the Second World War. I think we're down to less than 20,000 now. And it's good to see General Romer here representing that small crew. He was the few when he started his career, and he's now another few as, as the Second World War veterans pass on. And it's up to people like us to tell their stories now 
but I'm glad to see Richard and Michael here to tell their story because it's important that we hear it firsthand, not from secondhand voices like mine. Right now, we need to take a short break. We'll be right back with more of the Zoomer. the Second World War veterans who came back, rebuilt their families, trained themselves, contributed to society, and gave us the wealth that we enjoy today. In Flanders Field, the poppies blow. The poppies blow between the crosses. Row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived on sunset cloud. Scarce heard amid. The guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn. Saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. We lie in Flanders Field. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us, who die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow on Flanders Field. That was a musical rendition of In Flanders Fields, composed by Marilyn Lightstone, arranged by David Warwick, and sung by the Canadian Men's Chorus. It was written by John McRae in the spring of 1915 as the First World War entered its 11th month. The poem is a touchstone of remembrance, but polls show our knowledge is sadly lacking. For instance, only 2% of respondents correctly rank the Second World War as the conflict that caused the most Canadian deaths. Is this because of the passage of time and the loss of veterans who fought? Are we doing enough to remember, Jim? Well, I think there's, uh, we are doing enough because in particular the media, they, they always come forth at the right time of year around Remembrance Day. But in, in between, our, our local legions keep uh, the local parades and uh, decorations, and they, they keep uh, people in the forefront of what the veterans did. General Romer, do you agree? I am the Honorary Lieutenant General of the Canadian Armed Forces. I want to be very careful about what I have to say. I want to assist the whole question of remembering the sacrifice that was done in World War I and World War II and those fighting in between. Michael. I will take a different stand. 
I think that the, the fall of Afghanistan has put Afghanistan back into the forefront of the Canadian consciousness. But what it has done is it's ripped open some of the scabs of some of the colleagues that I fought with. Imagine coming home and adjusting to civilian life after one tour, two tours, three tours of hard combat in a country. And then suddenly pundits are talking about how much money has been spent and how quickly Afghanistan fell. For me, as one of the younger veterans here, I say this, the senior veterans have carved the way and remind us why we did what we did. I think the Canadian public has had Afghanistan, my war reintroduced to their, their psyche because of what's transpired in that country. I believe because we're a peaceful nation, we have the luxury of the peace that's been provided by some of the senior leaders you have here on this panel, that we sometimes forget the prices that people have paid. Let us never forget the 158 Canadian Forces members, seven civilians that lost their lives in Afghanistan and the 199 Canadian Armed Forces members that took their lives upon returning home. So for me, I, I believe that the Canadian public needs to have the sacrifice of their men and women in uniform in the forefront of their minds every time we go outside, look at a flag, hear peace and live in this great country. It's because of somebody else's sacrifices that we have what we have. Bill, we call them heroes. We have ceremonies, we have the highway of heroes, but is, is that just lip service or is it enough? Ooh, well, I, I think there's more going on. For example, at the end of the Second World War, there, there were 1.12 million veterans. When I was Regional Director of Veterans Affairs in the 1980s, there were 500,000. Today, there are only 22,000, roughly, Second World War veterans, but there are 500,000 veterans of the Canadian forces alive today. We remember everything that each of them have done, and we remember it largely because of the work that the veterans themselves have done in peacetime, once they got out of uniform, particularly the Second World War veterans who came back, rebuilt their families, trained themselves, contributed to society, led youth groups, rebuilt their communities, and gave us the wealth that we enjoy today. Okay, and Susan, you know, speaking of peacetime, a lot of people have this idea that uh, we are big peacekeepers, we're an influential middle power, it goes back to Pearson. But there are others who say, you know, uh, that is long gone and uh, we should get with the program and realize what our real place is as a military. Well, yes, there certainly are people who regret um, that Canada has decided not to take the peacekeeping role that it once did. When I was serving particularly, um, Canada had the reputation of being in every single peacekeeping mission there had been. And while we certainly still do have a very good reputation, um, it's up to the Canadian government to decide to do it. But I would also add that the Memory Project, which is part of Historic Canada, has 900 speakers, volunteers, serving and retired vets from the whole period that until COVID went to schools and community groups and church basements and all kinds of things. And the children and the students that I have been connecting with have been incredibly knowledgeable and incredibly inspired and respectful of the idea of remembrance. Okay, we'll be right back with more of the Zoomer. started in the intelligence branch, I was the one and only woman. And I was the first and only woman everywhere I was posted.
Welcome back. According to a poll for Historica Canada from last year, almost half of respondents think they know about the history of black, indigenous, and racialized groups in Canadian military service during the First and Second World Wars. But the evidence suggests otherwise. Only 14% correctly identify the number two construction battalion as Canada's first and only all black battalion. Now the Canadian Armed Forces is aiming to increase diversity among the ranks. But as things stand now, 16% of members are women, 8.7% are visible minorities, and 2.8% are Indigenous Canadians. So what do those numbers mean? And let's begin with Michael. So from my perspective, I say it this way. Um, my family, my dad immigrated from Nigeria. Uh, we're a Commonwealth family. My brother also served in the same regiment that I did. So my experience has been uh, here in Windsor, Ontario, where the Essex and Kent Scottish Regiment is. It's a fully diverse regiment. So it is the diversity of your community that will lead to the diversity of your regiments. I think that simply put, uh, the military was an excellent opportunity for me. It gave me insights that allowed me to become the person that I am today. And I think that what you simply have to do is remind people of any race or creed what this country means to them. That we have the freedom to disagree. We have the freedom to love who you want. You have the freedom to worship how you want. And in other places, you don't have that. So from my perspective, I think that the Canadian military simply has to demonstrate what the soldier receives from the military. If you look at the senior veterans, they all contributed to this country. I believe that everyone who puts on a uniform does as well. Sometimes we just don't tell our story well enough to entice people. And I believe the military can do a better job with that. Bill, what's your perspective as an indigenous soldier? <laughs> Well, I, I think I've been a pretty lucky fellow. I was one of the first Indigenous cadets at the Collège Militaire Royal de Saint-Jean uh, in 1956. I survived three years. And my time in the Navy, uh, I think, was enduring for one primary re reason, my shipmates. That's one thing about the military. I think the bond of friendship and comradeship that we build as individuals and as groups together and from the point of view of indigenous people they have absolutely no reason to go to war they don't know the conflict they don't know the places that they're going to give you an illustration in 1885 general wolseley was tasked with relieving khartoum and he recruited indigenous boatmen to take his troops up the nile because he was impressed with their boat handling now these guys didn't go over there because they were loyal to the crown or whatever. They went there for the adventure and they went there because a friend asked them to come and to demonstrate their skills. They had the opportunity and they had the skill to demonstrate what they could do. And while they were doing it, they built up those friendships and comradeships. And that's, I think, the basic case for to joining the Canadian forces. But are Indigenous soldiers recognized enough? What is a medal? <laughs> Tommy Prince is probably one of the most decorated soldiers. He served in Korea. Uh, he, he had five years almost constantly in combat. Another soldier from the First World War was Francis Pagnagabo. He was reputed to have killed a sniper some hundreds of enemies. They can be recognized for what they can contribute. Are they recognized? Yes, they're recognized. Are they remembered? Not so much. But in the past 25 years, that has been being reversed. First, with the establishment of the National Aboriginal Veterans Day on November the 8th and the ceremonies that, that ensues. And from within the Indigenous communities themselves, they honour veterans, even at powwows. Susan, there's an actual target for increasing the number of women members. They want it to grow from 16% to 25%. But of course, it's coming when the Canadian forces are roiling all these sexual abuse, sexual misconduct scandals. So it's one thing to say you want to increase the numbers, but is it a place that's okay for women? Well, I have 
been retired for 16 years. I do know that when I started in the intelligence branch, I was the one and only woman. And I was the first and only woman everywhere I was posted. They told me, you'd better measure up or we'll never let another woman in. I'm happy to report that evidently I did okay because now 25% of the intelligence professionals in the Canadian military are women. And that feels really good. And yes, there's no question that questions of the sexual military trauma um, and awful reports that keep coming out and senior men simply not getting it um, are awful. Should that mean that an adventurous woman who wants to serve her country, learn a profession, get an education, travel, leadership, teamwork, um, should totally avoid it? Um, I think not. Right. Don't go away. There's more when we return. Trauma of war affects everyone differently. So discussing it in a safe environment aids in the healing. Welcome back. PTSD and other medical problems are on the rise for veterans and serving personnel in Canada. Or maybe it's just that there is increased awareness of these problems. So how does Canada support its veterans? Is the federal government doing enough to help veterans transition to civilian life and to deal with their problems? Let's begin with Michael. In a, in a very unique way. I was 38 when I deployed to Afghanistan. So some of the young men and women that I fought with were 18 turning 19. With some of the things that we saw and some of the things that we did and some of the things that we couldn't do, the trauma of war affects everyone differently. When you come back home and you live in a peaceful nation and you try to explain to a parent why you feel bad sleeping on a wonderfully comfortable bed and why you are tuning into the TV to see how friends go, I think what has happened with occupational stress injuries is that the military has changed its position and now understands that you need to support these men and women. Could more be done? More can always be done. But do I believe that the Canadian public and the Canadian government is supporting and cares for her soldiers after they return? I will say I've, marked, I've seen a marked change even in my time with the Afghan vets. There's still some that are struggling. I'm privileged, I will speak to anyone anytime about my service, but there are some who never will. So recognizing that it exists is the, step, is the first step in allowing these men and women to feel better about coming home in one piece. Because as soldiers, you think about what if, what if I did, what if I didn't? What if I was there instead of him or her? What if I'd given a different order? And survivors also have to work through coming home. So discussing it in a safe environment, the Legion's a good safe environment, but also with other colleagues and comrades who've experienced similar things, aids in the healing. My backpack becomes lighter when I discuss what I've done in Afghanistan. And a weight more shared is more easily carried. General, I, mean, I know you're limited in what you can say, but uh, you know we all have heard horror stories about backlogs of claims by veterans. They're unable to get treatment in a timely way. Do you think the military is doing enough? As far as I know, the military is doing the best it can. Uh, what I wanted to talk about for a minute the question of remembering is very important. Uh, when Remembrance Day comes, I go back and look at the images of my comrades that I flew with and have died in service. And whether it was wartime or peacetime, I buried lots of people in peacetime as a squadron commander. And I make a, a, an important effort to remember 
the people that I flew with who were my buddies, my pals, because they're gone and I'm still, still here. I think one of the most important things about Remembrance Day is that we invite Canadians to think about those who have gone that they knew or families they didn't know, to thank those families, even mentally, for the sacrifice that they made through the loss of the person, be it a woman or a man, it doesn't matter. But we should really, on Remembrance Day, remember the people that we have associated with who have given their lives for Canada and will continue to do so. Back to the question of PTSD, uh, when you came back, uh, were you or your colleagues suffering from that? And uh, do you think the military does enough for those people? What I remember the most, I always call it the year of the lost souls, you know, the first year back. In Winnipeg, there was no mixed drinking. It was all strictly beer parlors. And it was just, uh, you go into a beer parlor, all there was was groups of people, ex-servicemen. Ex they were all telling their stories. They embellished their stories. Some were mixed and... Uh, it's a way of uh, ventilating and get, getting rid of uh, your PS, PTSD. It's a good thing that happened because it's, uh, you couldn't ask for better therapy than that than talking things over and over a glass of beer and you could uh, recall some of your, your, your experiences. At least you got out of your system and you exchange all these views among yourself. That's the way uh, I found the first year or so. Susan, uh, what is your take on the PTSD problem? I'm, I'm talking about, you know, clinical problem that has people unable to sleep. It has them have difficulties with their families, um, give way to violence. Is the military doing enough? When I had um, a problem and went to the doctor, uh, PTSD was just hardly anyone knew anything about it and he asked me with my file in front of him he and I was it was suggested by others so it wasn't just me saying there's a problem um and he asked me one question he said were you actually in danger of being killed now yes if I'd been in war it might have been the case but you can get PTSD in operational um, injuries other than actually being about to be shot. So when I answered no, he closed the file and that was the end of the discussion. So it was suck it up, kiddo. So I have buried this situation for a um, very long time. Um, but the recent um, sexual misconduct uh, reporting has brought this to the fore. And the military is really trying and they continue to um, move in the right direction. We need to take a short break. We'll be right back with more of the Zoomer. the first time that I've had the opportunity to join with a D-Day veteran, Army, when I was over his head protecting him uh, on D-Day. Welcome back in our quest to educate today's youth about what Remembrance Day is about. We've invited a couple of younger members of our audience to ask their questions of our panelists, beginning with Mary Frances Quinn. How does it make you feel when you see someone wearing a poppy? And what do you think when someone isn't wearing one around Remembrance Day? Michael, why don't you take that? My life has changed since I served. I come home and I look around and I see the peace we have. And I look at poppies and who is wearing them. From my perspective, it is the ultimate symbol of respect. And again, I look to the senior leaders that are on this panel with me. When I see people who are not wearing a poppy, I used to get angry. I used to get mad. I used to be overtly disappointed. But as one of my colleagues has said, poppies fall off. 
you're not making a statement by not wearing a poppy. If you are a Canadian and you are appreciative of the day, I would respectfully request that you do wear one. General? I want to pick up on something that uh, Jim and I haven't shared yet. He's a veteran of D-Day. You heard his story when he got out of the landing craft. And uh, the two of us were together over the beach. I was over the beach when you did that. And I was there in my Mustang at 500 feet. Right. And I'm being shot at as you were being shot at. It's the first time we've had an opportunity to talk about that kind right. of an association. So I'm very pleased to be here to be able to say this is the first time that I've had the opportunity to join with a D-Day veteran, Army, when I was over his head protecting him uh, on D-Day. That's a long time ago. Yeah. And to be in your presence and to hear your story was very enlightening uh, for me. And it seemed to be a repeat of that remembrance but I think about that time too, you had the Mustangs and I think it was the, the other aircraft, it was Typhoon, was it? Typhoon. The Typhoon, they come over with rockets and we see, we see them coming over and it was just to give you a good feeling that they were giving the Jerry hell. They come in, they, they had four rockets in each wing. You either fire the, the whole eight at once or two at a time. And we used to feel so good about it. They're doing our job, you know, <laughs> and it's, we were really happy to have them flying on our support. They were everywhere, strafing. Let's move on to the next question from Rianne Smith. How hard is it to make the decision to join the armed forces, knowing that you could die doing your job if you're called into action? Jim. Well, actually, I was just 15 when I joined. This was a thing to do. And I just went in and told them you were 18. And, uh, it wasn't a hard decision, sort of an adventurous thing because my family had been, my dad had been in, my uncles had been in the services in World War I, and uh, you just feel, felt you wanted to be part of the action. Wow. Yeah. Michael. Mine was, as some of the, the seniors have spoken, it was adventure, but to volunteer to go to Afghanistan, it was something I say my responsibility. My regiment formerly was the Essex Scottish Regiment, and I had the privilege of being on parade with a Victoria Cross winner. So when you walk in the footsteps of giants, you don't shirk your responsibilities. For me, to go to Afghanistan was not a, and I say this respectfully, it was not a choice. It was my choice, but it was an obligation to fulfill my responsibility. My Canadian citizen doesn't breed me rights from my perspective. It breeds me responsibilities. And it was my responsibility to fulfill that, uh, that calling. Okay, let's move on to the final question from Charlotte. Have you ever lost a friend in combat? And what do you remember about them? Bill, have you lost people in combat? Gordon Bearsford. Gordon was 19 years old, uh, served in HMCS St. Croix, and it was sunk by a torpedo on the 23rd of September, 1943. There were some members of the crew rescued by a, a British destroyer, Inchon, and unfortunately, that ship was again sunk the next day by another submarine, and all hands except two went down with that ship. When we come back, final thoughts from our panelists. That's next. Welcome back to The Zoomer. It's now time for final thoughts from our panelists, starting with Michael. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. Remembrance Day is the day that we stop, pause, remember the gift that we have for being in this country, and acknowledge the fact that the freedoms that we have have been paid for in blood by other Canadians. It's a day that we stop and acknowledge that everything we have has come at a price, and that Canadians have paid the price across races, creeds, colors, religions, everything. We live in the best country in the world, and we have those who are not here to thank us for what we have. Bill. Well, veterans, thank you for your service, particularly those from the First World War and the Second World War. 
Korea in peacetime. I really appreciate what you have done to make Canada a better place to live during my lifetime. Jim. Yeah, when I think of the veterans, that they, they all answered the call and they all served and a lot of them didn't come back. And it's uh, something you have to remember. We belong to families and they are fathers, sons and brothers. You can't forget these people. General? On the point of remembrance, in my squadron when I was on operations, I lost about eight of my pals through being shot down by enemy action. That was a tough time when that was occurring. But the reality is uh, we have to remember those people that have died. Remembrance Day, it's a good time to do it. Susan. I would echo all of those fine words and hope that our youth will keep learning about this and understanding and appreciating what has been done for them so they can have the lives they now do. And the uh, Air Force motto says it all rather well, per adua ad astra, through adversity to the stars. All the veterans of the First World War have passed away and the number of living World War II vets is rapidly dwindling. It's up to us to perpetuate their memory. Thank you for being with us and thank you to Marcus Venables playing the bugle. We'll see you soon. It's time to zoom out. Ha <laughs> ha